Creating engagement in the classroom, understanding the challenges of the modern day learning environment is written by Kevin Popovich and Ryan Bancher. Well, welcome to another series uh, in our webinar, Creating Engagement in the Classroom. I'm Kevin Popovich, uh, lecturer at San Diego State. And uh, today we will learn what exactly it means to form a real connection inside the higher education classroom. For instance, how does engaging in the classroom, professors and students alike, improve learning outcomes? Why is classroom management becoming increasingly difficult? Brian, any answers? Yeah, we'll have answers to those questions and a little bit more in just a minute. I'd like to introduce myself first. Um, I'm Ryan Vancher, an undergraduate student here at SDSU, uh, co-author with Kevin of Art Book, Create Engagement in the Classroom. And again, today we'll be discussing connecting with students, and we think you'll be interested in uh, a few of the observations that we've had through our time, uh, you know, on both sides of the podium here in academia. Right, and uh, today we are going to take a look at uh, what it means to connect with students, how this connection has changed over time, how students and professors can facilitate this engagement because it is just not the responsibility of one. We'll look at the student view, the professor view, and of course, uh, Q and A. Right, so uh, so let's get the. Let's just just jump, uh, jump start right in here. So the discussion by establishing um, this vital fact, right? Connecting with students has meant different things to different teachers over the years. Uh, when Socrates taught his students, one could assume connecting meant they understood the insight and information he provided. Uh, Rachel Carson, author of uh, Silent Spring, said, if facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions and impressions of the senses are the fertile soil in which the seeds must grow. Einstein touched on connections when he said, it is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. So as the role of the teacher changed, so did the concept of connecting. A strong connection between students and teachers may lead to students' advancement beyond academic success, um, encouraging them to grow and prosper in both their personal and professional endeavors. Uh, I'm fortunate to see this in my classroom quite a bit. Teachers possess skills, knowledge, and experience that are invaluable learning tools not offered in the classroom. When students and teachers connect beyond the curriculum offered in the course, then they open the door to new experiences, to new opportunities, and to uh, paths for success. So uh, for a professor, facilitating and nurturing this connection becomes a crucial objective, one that constantly evolves in today's academic landscape, but it's not impossible. We must turn to history and look ahead to best determine how to create this connection now and in the future. So I think it, the relationship between students and teachers has grown quite a bit, and it's something that, that kind of complicates the connection um, you know, and the result that we see, you know, class size is going to have a big impact on that as well. You know, kind of forcing um, smaller classes with more connection into these big impersonal style learning formats. And I've had this experience at SDSU, you know, which caught me off guard because I showed up on campus coming from community college, right, where we had 20 or 30 students max uh, in the classroom, kind of similar to, you know, the the graduate courses that you might experience at a university level. And I had to figure out how to adapt, you know, to 200, 300 student lectures where you know, my, my whole strategy was making sure the professor knew my name by asking good questions, showing up to office hours. Um, but once, you know, you get into these types of classes, there's no real format for Q&A when you're sitting in two, 300 student lectures, right? And so I think a teacher, like any person, uh, you know, has a, has a very limited capacity in terms of, you know, getting to know the names and faces and, and you know, getting to know their students on a more personal level than their student ID, right? I think Dunbar, Dunbar's number was something we talked about recently, KP, right. where um, he had, I think, 150 relationships max that humans are capable, you know, of handling in a, in a social uh, environment. And so for me, I've already kind of maxed out my social um, environment in terms of my 150, so I don't know how much more room I have for, you know, names and faces if I'm an instructor, you know, between your colleagues, your, your faculty, and, you know, and your immediate bosses, I think you're already kind of maxed out there on a campus. So as these classrooms grow, you know, way beyond the 150 limit, um, I think the requirements for connecting students are, are growing with them. Um, but if you don't have any, you know, tools or anything in place that allows you to do that, or at least some strategy, um, it can definitely hinder your teaching relationships, right? And even if you have the best of intentions and you try to get to know students, right, there's still some physical limitation um, that, that is, is present on the part of the professor, but it's also experienced by us as students. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, Ryan. Um, and, and here's what one of the things I've observed. In a typical classroom, I have about 50 unique students, right? So each 
has a unique name. Of course, each has a unique student identification number. At the beginning of each semester, um, this is what I know of them, and it forms the foundation of our relationship. So as each week progresses, I learn which students show up for class, and I notice which of those do not. I also start putting a face with the name through participation. Uh, the students who ask the most questions become the faces I recognize the most, uh, and I just see more of them because we're interacting more often regularly. So um, the more I interact with them, the more they interact with me. Um, the increased level of engagement increases the number of questions, the number of answers, uh, and the knowledge transfer they receive. Others who watch this engagement get something, but I don't believe it's the same as if those as if those are the ones asking the questions. Their questions mean something more to them than someone else's question will. My answers to them generate a different feeling than answers to someone else's questions. So this is the part of our relationship I can customize for my students when time permits. That seems to make a difference to the success of that student. The more engaged a student, the greater the learning. The more unique uh, their experience, the greater the relationship. The greater the relationship, the greater the outcome. It all starts with me encouraging their participation and generating a worthwhile takeaway once they do interact, because there's nothing worse about them getting psyched up and then nothing really comes of it, right, Ryan? Yeah, exactly. And I think you, what you're talking like secondhand learning, so to speak, where, where you know you might hear somebody ask a question, and well, it's a question you needed the answer to. You know, you may have asked it a little bit different. So I think it's important that students ask questions with their own expression built into that as well. Um, I've also, like, admired educators. Like you say, you try to shake up classes quite a bit, right, with these, you know, unique strategies to try to reach their students. Um, I think these kind of professors, they really understand the importance of tapping into, like, the back-end classroom tools, right, right. things that aren't really put in place by the professor but that the students choose to opt into. And you know, so, so professors will give us the, the learning management systems like blackboards, and you know, we'll have ebooks with, you know, intuitive learning and, and everything else built into them, which is great. And the professor, you know, sees that there's value in those for the learning process. But on the other hand, you know, as, as myself, I've been in classes where every single class we start a Facebook group, and all the students in the class get invited. You know, and this is where all of our, our conversations are happening about collaborating on projects, sharing class information. And so, you know, most of our engagement actually is occurring outside the lecture in terms of with each other. Um, which is usually through mobile devices or you know some sort of you know social form, um, but I think there's one person that I've noticed, especially you know in my office visits, that always drives my conversations further, and definitely helps me dial them back. You know as I as I go down you know too far in the wrong direction, and I think the professor never gets an invite you know to these social conversations and never is in these group chats where where students are actually discussing content. And, and I think it's, you know, a disservice to, you know, both the students and the professors that there's these conversations happening that both sides aren't participating in. Right, right. But, there's a, but then again, there's also, like, uh, you know, a couple exceptions to these where professors are setting up, you know, Twitters and they're setting up class, you know, uh, programs where students can communicate. And I think these guys are the ones who tend to have, you know, positive problems where, you know, their classes are filling up way too quick or they don't have enough room, so they got to create a spillover. You know, these professors that we talk to, in the, you know, with, with my day-to-day -day work um, tend to be the ones that, you know, they take the risk, but they also get a lot of reward in terms of, you know, the satisfaction they get from the student evaluations and the responses, you know, for their willingness to take the risk. Right. Well, good problems to have, right? So uh, there are resources like Rate My Professor, um, you know, one of the most widely used tools by students when registering for classes that facilitate this, right? You know, ever wonder... What students think of your class, take a look. You know, sometimes it's a little surprising, right? You know, uh, I'm always interested in the, uh, those that I get uh, as well. Um, a testimonial found on Rate My Professor, you know, praises uh, Dr. McClure uh, at San Diego State University demonstrating the impact an engaging class can have on a student. Right, so here's what one of them had to say. By far the best method teacher in the credential program. It was a blessing to have her. We learned so much from her. She is extremely knowledgeable and does everything she can to help you succeed. I actually looked forward to going to this class as it flew by because we were learning and having fun all at the same time. Right, uh, nice quotes to have. And I'll tell you, um, I'd love to be able to hear um, you know more of those types. Um, and here's another we got from a student um, working together with other students on projects, live chat rooms and study groups, and the best way to engage other students. Uh, says uh, Derek Arganza, a graduate student at State. Um, social media groups are also very useful for planning events and outreaches for students that have specialized hobbies. And then it takes leadership out of outgoing students and professors to create a welcoming atmosphere to make sure that nobody is left out. Um, so Ryan, you tell me, 
from your perspective, what are some of the techniques that you've experienced or heard of that professors are using to create engagement? Actually, um, one of the more unique ones that I found that actually doesn't take technology at all, it just takes a little bit of creativity and, and some organization was from uh, a professor named Tanya Renner. So she was brand new to the biology department at SDSU and she was actually an alumna of the, uh, the campus as well. And she had come back to teach classes in biology and so I was asking her, you know, what about uh, what kind of engagement techniques she was using and so she had this really cool um, student response you know in her classroom where she could actually gauge her audience uh, teaching in the bigger classes by assigning each student four pieces of colored paper uh, and what they were able to do was when she would ask a question she would say you know which color represented which response and the students would hold up their pieces of colored paper depending upon how they chose to respond to the question and so she would actually get a visual representation of, of how her class was feeling or or you know their feedback on you know uh, polling questions and, and to see, you know, if, did you think it's A, B, C, or D? So she kind of replaced the eye clicker with traditional paper um, in a large classroom. Of course, if the students forgot the paper, it could kind of yeah. enter the exercise, but um, I, you know, obviously cutting out four colors of paper for 150 students could be, you know, a little bit time consuming, but I think once you get it in place and everybody's comfortable with it, uh, I think that was a very creative and probably effective over time strategy that she was using to you know, keep her class engaged and make sure she was, you know, giving them some sort of personalized attention. Right. The other things, though, I think, uh, like Pebble Sugar, like McGraw Hill, right? They, I, I've been using Learn Smart, you know, in some of my classes, which is this adaptive learning program, um, which is really interesting because it lets me focus my time on my individual learning, you know, progress. So I'm really spending my time just reading what they highlight and tell me I need to work on, as opposed to trying to memorize every single word. Um, and some of these approaches, you know, in, in combination with unique creative, you know, engagement strategy coupled with, you know, types of technology that can help you adapt to the individual learner. Um, I think some of these are some unique systems that allow us to uh, enhance learning a bit more by, you know, using the tools that are available to us. Right. You know, then there's inside the classroom, right, the tools like CourseKey, uh, flexible Q&A system. Um, it is very helpful for me um, and allows me to easily administer real-time formative assessments that offer visual results, right, as soon as the last student response is, um, is submitted, you know, um, and I got to tell you, this is one of the, the easy wins that I'll tell you, you know, because I, I you know, for instance, my classes, uh, I teach a two and a half hour lecture and, you know, even when, you know, I'm on, you know, I still remember what it's like to be in uh, a seat for two and a half hours, you know, trying to take a look, you know, really trying to stay engaged and uh, breaking it up with, you um, just quick polls on, you know, hey, what do you think about this, A, B, and C, uh, or being able to put uh, a five-question uh, quiz together and then being able to go through the results step by step. So, for instance, I'll, I'll throw up a quiz, and it'll have, uh, you know, A, B, and C. Um, people will select the answers after the fact. I can now bring up uh, the, the show that some answered A, some answered B, some answered C, and I can ask those people that made their answers, I said, make your point. Why did you select your answer? So now I'm building discussion uh, and, uh, around this visual. And then uh, after everybody's kind of made their point, I click show my answer, and then the answer is revealed. And it just puts a, a little uh, a visual focus on, and it facilitates some additional discussion. So it's more than just throwing out a quiz. It's been very helpful. So the ability to gauge this um, student audience uh, with uh, non-graded polling allows me for a second or more quality look at what my students are really retaining as I'm taking through there. Just not these very passive, you know, quiz grades. Hey, read the assignment on your own, and then I'll give you the quiz, and then your grade will go posted without anything more than that. And uh, I find that this really helps build much more of a connection. Um, so each of these methods offers good ways to create engagement by keeping your fingers on really the pulse of the class. Um, and then these data-driven approaches to engagement allow educators to become much more flexible and proactive when early indicators of failure begin to show. Yeah. So I think a uh, pretty good conversation, right? Where we're going to go from here. We talked quite a bit about, you know, the throughout the blog series, how education is constantly evolving, um, you know, as the demand of the classroom requires. And so as these class sizes grow and, you know, the, the relationships and those strong bonds that, you know, used to be developed between teachers and students are, you know, starting to dwindle a little bit. Um, I think it's important that we talk about, you know, the connection between, why the connection between students and teachers is, you know, greater than ever, um, and, and why does it have so much potential to create and, and yield more opportunities in the learning process. 
right? So it's uh, not too late to turn things around, right? With the assistance of mobile technologies in the classroom, teachers can once again retain and rebuild the strong relationships uh, that make both sides much more successful. It just takes a bit of effort, I think. So we've got some questions, I think, Ryan. Yeah, so for our first question, uh, let me see, this one looks short. So this one's asking more about other other techniques, so I'll just defer this one to you as a professor, right? Sure. Uh, and you teach creativity and innovation, that's got to be a pretty, you know, difficult subject. It's It uh, doesn't exactly have formulas built into it. Right. So I'm curious, how would you, you know, stimulate your engagement in the classroom? I know you talked a little bit how you use the Q&A and the polling systems, um, but do you have any other techniques or activities that are in place that co consistently generate results? So I think they're just looking for... You know, what are the outcomes of your techniques that you were mentioning? Yeah, right. So some of the techniques that I've got is, um, you know, first you, you, you take a look at the content um, by which you're um, you're building your class on. Right. So I have, a, I have a solid book. You know, if I didn't like the book, I wouldn't have used it. It's uh, Creativity Inc. by Mousy. Um, and it provides uh, a good process and understanding of my subject matter. Um, I supplement with that with some uh, other articles. And I can't tell you how much, how many times I get comments from students to say, hey, that thing in the article, it's just, it, it's just like we learned in the book, right? And there's also some, some kind of magical validation because somebody else outside the book said what the author said in the book. But it's it's, yeah. unless it, it's something that breaks it up. So instead of just two and a half hours on uh, on subject matter, there's there's uh, maybe 20 minutes, a half hour on the book. And then there's a quiz on the book, right? So we have some discussion around that material. Then there's a related article, different perspective, um, different information. It's a little bit of a quiz and a Q&A on that. Sometimes I have the students teach that uh, portion instead mm -hmm. of just me doing the lecture, right? We kind of turn it around a little bit. Students tend to um, react very well to that. Um, we interject it, you know, with some just to, some different games related to our subject material and not games necessarily in the, you know, the childish or the, the playful set, but just things that are related. Um, for instance, as, as you said, you know, the class I teach, creativity and innovation, can be a little challenging. Um, so we play uh, rock, scissors, papers um, as a demonstration of uh, games that uh, we were taught as kids that make us very competitive. Uh, and then uh, there's a variation of that game uh, called uh, Tiger Fireworks Hello that uh, my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Akshay Satish, had, uh, had taught me. And, uh, and it's a game of collaboration, same gesture, but a different goal. And it's things like that where we're having fun in the classroom, but it's to make a point. And I can't tell you how many times students will reference those games as a learning moment where something clicked for them that they've retained that's uh, related yeah. to the book material um, that's helped reinforce everything. So these little bits and pieces, a little video here, uh, you know, a quick sidebar with a personal story. <laughs> these are the techniques, Ryan, that I think that, you know, uh, I've experienced that takes a two and a half hour lecture and uh, makes it much more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you built in like learn knowledge, activity knowledge, uh, and then teaching knowledge at some point. You said some students are required to teach it. So yeah. um, kind of an interesting uh, triple approach to the learning process. Right. So here's one for you, Ryan. The um, uh, question is, uh, what, can a prof what can a professor do in your mind to make you feel more willing to speak up and engage? What makes you comfortable uh, and ready to ask questions and participate? Um, I think the first thing to do is kind of address the unwillingness to speak up and, and from the students that I've talked with I think you know just something as simple as the class layout can, can you know encourage students to or discourage students from talking for example if, if you have you know a long long class where you know you're further away from the professor and now it requires for you to speak up and have your voice travel just the distance alone you know from you and the professor could be something that hinders you from talking if that's you know your personality type now, for me personally, I'm I'm more of you know a type A student in the front that always tries to raise his hand. No. So I've never had that problem. But at one point when I had my health issues, you know there was you know a point where I jumped to the back of the class where I didn't feel as confident, I didn't feel you know as comfortable in my own skin, so to speak. And so I had to find other tools. And when I when um, one of my classes, the professors had um, one of his GAs run run a Facebook group for us. Um, I noticed I was you know from the hospital bed, I was able to contribute to the classroom conversation. Uh, you know, plugging into the live lecture capture that, you know, that's done through Blackboard. Right. I was able to ask questions, you know, that I couldn't ask from class. And I just always think, you know, how many more, you know, I've, I've had professors talk about, you know, in my Blackboard forums, you know, I get these students who speak up and when I, when I try to find them in class, I have no idea who the face is that goes with that name. Right. But they've got something really powerful to say, you know, in the forums, but they'll, I never hear them talk in class. 
And I just think the, the student expression, you have to kind of come from a point of, you know, how are students preferring to, to express themselves? And today, you know, it is digital. You know, very few, it's sad to say people, can you shake their hand and look them in the eye? Um, but they'll connect with you on Facebook and LinkedIn and say hi, and, you know, they'll figure out what you guys have in common. They're just a lot more comfortable in their skin, you know, through a digital uh, medium of expression. And so um, I think it just boils down to one, you know, considering what are the, the root causes of that, that are discouraging students from participating, and then two, figuring out, you know, how can you alleviate that and then finding the methods that they're already using, um, you know, whether you know it or not, and just plugging into those in yourself to get that kind of expression that you're looking for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good insight. Well, that's what we've got for today so far. Um, uh, thanks for all the questions, and there are uh, more answers um, on our website, in the blogs, and on social media. So um, this wraps up our um, third webinar in the series. Uh, and even though this one's wrapping up, our conversations still continue. Um, Ryan, we can uh, send them to where? Where are we sending people today? Yeah, um, so you guys can download the ebook, uh, Creating Engagement in the Classroom, if you'd like to learn more um, about how you know we're helping professors create engagement in their classroom. And whether you're a teacher or a student, you know there's uh, more to learn on both sides of that podium, we like to say. So feel free to plug in, to, no matter what kind of listener you are. Um, you can contact us and add comments to the blogs on our website at creatingengagementintheclassroom.org. Um, or just simply follow the conversation on social media by using the hashtag creating engagement. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the best places to get started. And then feel free to reach out personally, obviously, uh, if you'd like to contribute to the conversation. Of course. So, uh, Ryan, thanks uh, for another interesting conversation. Um, thanks, to everybody, for joining our conversation. And please consider sharing this with your fellow educators and students so they can share their expertise, opinions, and experiences as well. Thanks, everybody. See you, Ryan. See you, man. Thanks. Creating Engagement in the Classroom, Understanding the Challenges of the Modern-Day Learning Environment is written by Kevin Popovich and Ryan Vancher. To learn more about creating engagement in your classroom, visit creatingengagementintheclassroom.org or follow hashtag creatingengagement.